Erdrum Kaleri, it's my pleasure to introduce to you all, uh, and I think you're going to enjoy his presentation. And I'm an assistant professor at Oregon State University. I started about four years ago. And my main research area is payment materials, payment structures, and mostly asphalt uh, materials related research. The title of my presentation is Payment and Sustainable Research at Oregon State University. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. First, I will briefly talk about the OSU payment research program, uh, just like a general overview. Uh, and then I will talk about the research projects and the major findings from those research projects. And I will talk about the products we have developed uh, through those research projects. This is, our, uh, this is one part of our payment lab. Uh, so this is the mix, uh, asphalt mix production lab part of the lab. So we have a mixed preparation area, uh, different test equipments. And this is another view from another location in the mix lab. Uh, so we have gyratory compactor, we have a roller compactor to simulate the actual uh, construction in the field with a vibratory uh, roller compaction system. So we can also determine the compactibility of different asphalt mixes. So we have a four-point banding tester for, uh, to conduct cracking experiments. And this is our major test equipment, a UTM-30, in which uh, we can conduct pretty much all asphalt cracking and rutting uh, related standard experiments. Uh, we are also, uh, in addition to those uh, capabilities, we are also developing test equipments at OSU, uh, mostly for tech code testing. Uh, and I'm going to briefly talk about those as well. Uh, so these are actually 100% uh, made at OSU, uh, from software to hardware. And I will talk about those briefly in a minute. We have an asphalt preparation room for testing as sawing uh, and cutting systems are available. Uh, and this is the mixed part. And the other part is the binder testing lab, uh, part, uh, lab uh, at OSU. So we, have, we can conduct all uh, binder experiments, all the standard experiments with the binders. We can do aging uh, at different levels. We have a new DSR we recently purchased. So we can characterize tack code materials and asphalt binder materials. And we have uh, several different sponsors. Our major uh, sponsor is Oregon DOT, uh, ODOT. We also had a project from Caltrans, California Department of Transportation, and then Pacific Northwest Transportation Consortium is another uh, fund, funding agency. And we have several different industry partners uh, and uh, sponsors as well. And Tallwood uh, Design Institute is another. We recently had a different project from them, so they are uh, constructing a cross-laminated timber parking garage in Springfield. So we are designing the asphalt uh, and different strategies for this parking garage, the CLT parking garage, which is an interesting project we recently completed. So the research projects are major findings. Uh, so this was actually our first research project uh, funded by Oregon Department of Transportation uh, about the HMA layer adhesion through tack codes. Uh, so in this project, uh, the, we actually know the importance of tack codes. So if you have good bonding, you can actually improve the uh, longevity of the payment. Uh, but how are you going to create that good bonding between the new layer and the existing layer? So what are the strategies to do that? So can we use new engineered demolitions to improve the bonding? Or what is the importance of uh, application rates? What are the importances of uh, uniformity during the application? So these are like different questions we try to answer in this research project. Uh, so on the left uh, side, you can see an unbonded two uh, wood blocks which are not bonded and we apply like uh, they, are, they are applying a 60 pounds uh, of weight and then you can see the deflection is 0.5 inches but if you glue these two blocks together and then put 160 pounds deflection is going to be like half of what you got from the lower weight so this is a test conducted previously uh, not in our lab but in a different lab uh, and you can here you can basically see the importance of bonding. And here you see different bond failures. Uh, so you, uh, once you have these failures, which can happen from uh, problems at the construction, or they can also happen from uh, they can break over time the bonding uh, due to vehicular loading. So which can be uh, another reason for the bonding. And these are extremely important. So if you have good bonding, you are, your, the longevity of your payment is going to improve a lot. So the, here you can see another failure. Uh, so they had some problems, uh, cracking issues. Uh, and after that, they did trenching to do like some uh, forensic investigation to determine the reason for the failure. And you can see a clear delimination uh, between the SMA layer and the dense graded layer. And there are several examples uh, you can find in the literature. Uh, so Ralphie and Chagnon in 2000, they did one study. And according to their study, lack of bond reduces the service life from 20 years to 7 years. So you can lose 13 years of life from your payment. 
uh, by, uh, due to the problem with the bonding. Or another study, King and May, 50% loss in fatigue life when the bond is reduced by 10%. Another study emphasizing the importance of bonding. Uh, and I can count like several of those. Kurencheva, reduction of 80% in life for uh, the bonded interface between bays uh, and the roadway. So that's these studies and the research we did in this research project. These are all emphasizing the uh, importance of tech codes. And if you have good bonding between the top layer, the new layer, and the existing layer, your payment structure is going to be behaving like a monolithic uh, structure, and you are not going to have localized failures. And when you compare the cost of tech codes uh, to the asphalt cost, it's going to be much less. So this by finding the best quality, highest quality material tech code is very important. So I'm not going to get into too much detail, but I, at the end of my presentation, I will uh, give some references to our reports and research papers. You can also contact me. I can send you those reports and papers. So the first technology we developed in this tech code research project is uh, a wireless uh, OFTCT, Oregon Field Tech Code Tester. So this system is basically uh, has like a piston on it. Uh, so you can see the piston in the middle. Uh, and we control this wirelessly. So this is like a tensile load experiment. So after you apply the tech code, we break the tech code by heating it. Uh, and this is all wireless. So we developed the software for it so we can control this wirelessly through a laptop computer or a uh, tablet computer. Uh, and what you do is you lower the piston and then you first break it, you create the temperature control and then you wait for uh, the bond to be created and then you give the comment wirelessly uh, to pick it up, to pull it up, so you determine the tensile strength of the tech code uh, during construction. Another system we developed is a pulse construction test. Uh, so this is a torque tester, Oregon Field Torque Tester. Uh, so in this one, what you do is you, after construction, after you have the top layer, you core your payment right below the bond. So you're not taking a full depth core, but just, just below the bond. Uh, and then after that, you glue a platen on top of this core. And once your glue is set, you bring this uh, OFTT and then break the bond. Uh, again, using a software, we control it. And you torque it and determine the shear strength uh, required to break this tech code. Uh, and these can be like important quality control tests. And we got very high correlations between this experiment and the expensive lab experiment in which you need to take like a full depth core, bring it to the lab, cut it, and then do the shear test with the expensive uh, hydraulic test equipment. But you don't need to do that with the system. You, just, you can just conduct the experiment uh, in the field, which is a major advantage. And this is the new version. We, uh, so after this first project, we got the implementation project uh, for these tech code technologies from ODAT. Uh, and this is the new version we developed in the new project, the implementation project. So it's more portable and everything is in one uh, cart and we can move it from one location to another easily. We also developed an iOS and an Android apps uh, which can actually tell you uh, the tech code set time. So it's very important to know the tech code set time because you want to avoid tracking in the field and you want your tech code to set before you allow the uh, construction traffic. Uh, and it's sometimes very hard to determine uh, this tech code set time uh, properly. So we did some laboratory experiments, we developed some models, and then we incorporated those into uh, apps uh, which are available in iOS uh, and Android app stores. Uh, so you can basically enter the wind speed, the temperature, payment temperature, or air temperature. You can also enter the tech code type, uh, and you can also enter the application rate, and it will just calculate the set time predicted. And then you can just tap on it and start the countdown. And at the end of this countdown period, it's going to send a notification to the contractor saying that your tech code is set so you can allow the construction traffic. So an alternative we developed, which is simpler than using the app, is uh, the wheel tracking device. So in this one, this is like a very heavy uh, equipment. So you just roll it. After one roll, it will lock itself out. Uh, and you have, we have actual truck tires, tire material uh, we used on it. And you can, we actually made those tires in a way that you can actually have the same pressures you have in a truck tire, uh, a construction vehicle. And then after you roll it once, you can check the tires to determine whether, whether the uh, tires are tracking or not. Or you can, if you want to quantify the tracking, you can take these wheels off, the black, two black wheels you see on it, and then weigh them to determine the quantify the tracking. And then we also develop finite element models uh, to evaluate different options, like how uh, different spraying rates, application rates, uh, different tech code types are affecting the performance. So in this one, you have different layers, and this is like a numerical model. Uh, you roll a tire on it, a truck tire or different vehicular tires, 
uh, and then you can actually determine the stresses and strains under different conditions and uh, optimize the performance. So using thicker asphalt is better. Using this engineered emulsions are better than using the CSS one. So you can make these decisions in uh, a numerical model. So this is the implementation project we got uh, about eight months ago. So we are still working on uh, implementing these technologies. And at the same time, we are taking several hundreds uh, of field cores and then producing cores in the lab to evaluate different strategies, different uh, tackles from different companies, engineer demolition, CSS1H, CSS1. So we are evaluating these different tap codes in the lab and also by taking cores from the field and testing them in our lab. So another uh, important part is the thin lace uh, for payment preservation. Uh, so you can actually do like take two inches, meal two inches, and then put another two inches on it. Uh, or you can even use like thinner alternatives. Uh, but when you do that, the important thing is the performance. So one thing that's going to control your performance for thin lace is going to be the tack codes. So they are going to be very important. The other thing, of course, is going to be the material properties for the thin lay. So what kind of asphalt are you using? So is using softer asphalt going to improve the longevity for cracking? Or is it going to be better to use a stiffer asphalt with high binder contents to improve the cracking performance? So we try to make these decisions uh, in these research projects. The other question we try to answer is, can we increase the wrap contents, which is going to make things more economical? So if you increase your wrap content, uh, then you can pay more. You can improve the condition of your highway networks, which is going to be also important for preservation. We develop different strategies for uh, the implementation of uh, those asphalt materials. Increasing wrap, we develop different strategies. And then we try to answer the question of, is RAS, recycled asphalt shingles, a viable option in Oregon? So how are they affecting the overall performance of the asphalt materials? So the first project related to those uh, improving the asphalt performance is the adjusting asphalt mixes for increased durability. So how can we improve the cracking resistance of asphalt mixes? And the other important thing is if you need, want to improve the performance of uh, asphalt, you need to be able to test it first. So you need to have a proper laboratory experiment to characterize the performance of the asphalt. So here you see several uh, different grad students uh, who worked in this research project. And we also had several undergrad students who, are, who has been helping us uh, constantly. So that's why we also have a research program and a teaching program in which we teach students uh, to do research. Uh, and I'm also re I have developed several different courses within the last four years uh, for teaching undergrads and grad students payment engineering and uh, asphalt materials. We had different experiment types. We evaluated uh, SCB semicircular band, bending beam fatigue. I'm not going to get into too much detail with those, but the purpose was to, uh, to select the best cracking experiment that's going to characterize uh, the, all the Oregon uh, mixes. And then these are like dynamic modulus tests, flow number tests. As I said, we are capable of conducting all these uh, standard experiments. We did field sampling a lot because we always believe that field materials are going to be more realistic. Uh, than having like lab produced materials because you, are, you have the actual compaction in the field uh, and the material properties and the production variability are going to be apparent uh, in the field. And this is for example, at the end we selected the semicircular band test uh, after we got all the results. And this is like a typical um, one of the results we got for the cracking project. So here, for example, if you look at these three bars, uh, you see mix one, mix two, mix three performance. So mix one and mix two are uh, polymer modified mixes, the ones with green and um, red circles, and the one with uh, uh, black one is, the, is, a, is not polymer modified. So you can see the importance of uh, polymer modification from this result. Uh, and these are actually 6% uh, and there are like, you can also see the binder content difference. We did 5.3% binder content and 6% binder content. And there is a huge improvement by increasing your binder content by 0.7% uh, in the cracking resistance of the mix. And in most of these cases, we didn't observe any rutting failures when we conduct our rutting tests. So that's why the mixes are uh, most of the time on the dry side. Putting more binder is not going to hurt uh, that much. And you, the circles you see here uh, are for 7% air void content, meaning 93% uh, density. And the ones you see here are for 5% air void content. So you can see the huge uh, important difference uh, between by comparing like green circle to green one, uh, the bars in the green circles to green ones and the red ones to red ones. So you can see a significant improvement when you increase your density by just 2%, so which is uh, pointing out the importance of compaction. So if you compact it well, your performance is going to be very high because your strength is going to be high. 
And here, I just want to bring your attention. Here, we are not simulating the aging effect, because if your AROD content is high, your mix is going to age more. And we are not simulating it here. So we are just simulating the reduced uh, AROD content effect and the high density effect. And the other thing is moisture sensitivity. If you can compact it well and reach this 5% AROD content level, 95% density, then water cannot easily infiltrate through the mix, and you are not going to have uh, moisture issues. Uh, so that's why uh, another important project uh, is going to be a compactability. How can we compact the mixes better so that we can improve the longevity of the payment? And the other thing is don't put too much binder in, but compact, compact better. Uh, because if you, are, if you put 0.7% binder more, uh, you are going to be increasing the cost of the mix as expected. But if you do a life cycle cost analysis, this can actually give you a lower life cycle cost uh, because it's going to improve your performance significantly. Uh, but if you do better compaction, and if you just increase your binder content slightly, your compaction is also going to improve. So these are going to uh, eventually improve the performance. And here you see the significant benefit of uh, polymers. The left two ones are um, polymer modified. The one on the right is not polymer modified. So polymer modification improved the performance significantly. And these are the results for writing experiments. So the, Vertical, uh, the horizontal uh, solid red line is the limit from Ashto, and we simulated the same conditions and we conducted the experiment. So you can see that most of the cases, uh, almost all the cases are higher than the limit from the Ashto, uh, meaning that our flow numbers are very high, so we, are, we don't have rutting issues. But in some cases, you can see that they are significantly higher than the limit, which is telling us that the mixes are on the dry side, so we can actually put more binder uh, in the mixes to improve the cracking resistance. Uh, without sacrificing uh, any rotting resistance. So we did, uh, by using these test results, we also did uh, different simulations for payment preservation for maintenance and rehabilitation. Uh, we used the MEPDG, uh, Mechanistic Empirical Payment Design Guide. So this is more like the simulation of traffic, climate, and material properties. So we take the lab test results, get the mo model coefficients, put them in MEPDG, or the new name is Ashtoware. Uh, so in this software, you also enter the Oregon climate for Portland, for example, or Eugene, and then you enter the uh, traffic levels, and then you do the simulations to determine how the, these uh, materials are going to perform for this climate region. And according to our life cycle cost analysis, uh, for most of the cases, increasing binder content is definitely going to increase your initial cost, but it's going to reduce, it may actually reduce your life cycle cost if you do a simulation for 30, 40 years because they are going to last longer and you don't need to do maintenance uh, frequently. Another uh, project was binder grade bumping uh, and high binder content to improve the performance of rep and RAS mixes. So in this one, we used softer binders, stiffer binders. Uh, we used 30%, 40% RAP. Uh, we had RAS materials. We conducted over uh, 300 experiments in our lab uh, to evaluate different strategies to come up with suggestions for all that. Uh, and then here you see some results. So you, when you look at the blue ones are for the soft binder, uh, gray ones are uh, the cracking resistance is the y-axis, gray ones are uh, for the stiffest binder. So when you look at it, stiffer binder is reducing your cracking resistance, which is expected. Uh, but when we developed a decision-making tool, and I'm going to show you the results in a minute, stiffer binders can actually be better for cracking resistance if you use them at high binder contents. Because, for example, at 7622 is so stiff and it's uh, polymer modified, so its strength for rutting is so high, increasing the uh, binder content uh, at 0.5 or 0.6 percent is not really going to give you a mix that's going to fail in rutting. So rutting resistance is still going to be high, and you can improve the cracking resistance by increasing this binder content level. And this is the major finding of this study. After getting all the results, we developed these uh, regression equations. Uh, so those are the models uh, to predict the cracking and rotting resistance. And we use those to make our decisions for uh, different wrap contents, binder contents, and PG grades. So what we basically did is we first developed the models, and then we just throw numbers in those uh, to simulate different cases for wrap contents, binder contents, and PG grades. And this is what we got at the end. So here, for fl uh, flexibility index is the cracking, which is the x-axis, uh, the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is the flow number, which is the rotting resistance. And if, when we put our limits that we got from the previous project, this is the region of acceptance, the one on the top right. And when you look at the points falling into this region of acceptance, you can see that majority of those points are stiffer binders, PG 7622. And the reason is 
As I said, they are so resistant to rotting, you can increase the binder content of those mixes, and they are still not going to rot, and they can provide higher cracking resistance. Uh, of course, we did cost analysis as well. They are a little bit on the more expensive side, because you are going to be increasing the binder content, and these binders in Oregon, they are a little bit more expensive than the conventional 6422s. Uh, but still, your life cycle cost is going to be much lower because you don't need to do maintenance very often uh, because the performance is going to be very high. And after all this, uh, we all that wanted to develop a balanced mix design method for Oregon, uh, so which is like a new concept. So rather than just focusing on the volumetrics, we should also focus on the performance. So all the projects we did so far, and I showed you in this presentation, are uh, actually for this development of the balanced mix design method. So we developed the best cracking and rotting uh, tests for Oregon and the conditions for it. And then how can we design the mixes by not just considering the volumetrics, but also considering the performance. And this is also a hot topic in the United States. Several, uh, as far as I know, eight states are uh, in the research pro pro uh, process. And two states, I think Illinois, uh, and the other one is New Jersey, I believe. Uh, are actually implementing the balanced mix design uh, in their states. And in this one, as I said, uh, there is a weak region, so you can use a Hamburg test as you're running, in this case, DTC or a fracture energy test. So we decided to use a semicircular band test and a flow number test. And then once you determine the failure thresholds for rutting and cracking, you can actually design your mix by conducting, preparing different mixes in the lab with the gyratory compactor as you do for the volumetric design. But in addition to volumetric design, you also test it for rotting and cracking to determine whether it's going to fail uh, or not. Because you can have two mixes designed with the same volumetric design, and they, volumetrics can be very similar, but they are not going to be performing exactly the same. One of them might fail earlier than the other one, because it might have different properties in it. And in the past, everything was easy, because we didn't have polymer modification, we didn't have rubbers. Uh, so it was more like cooking a steak, as simple as that. But now the food is more complicated because you have different wrap contents, uh, do you have polymers, you have fibers, so that's why you need to measure this performance. Uh, otherwise, you are going to have problems with just uh, using the volumetrics. And this is going to be a process uh, similar to what we did. So we are going to be using the thresholds for writing and cracking to evaluate these performances. And then the other thing is the payment structure and deflection effects on vehicle fuel economy. This was a Caltrans project. Uh, so as you make your roads smoother, you are reducing your user costs uh, because your fuel consumption and vehicle operating costs are going to be less. And in this one, we developed models for uh, Caltrans. Uh, and the major university in this one was University of California, uh, Davis, uh, University of California Payment Research Center. And OSU was a subcontractor with MIT and MSU. And we developed different models uh, to develop strategies for state DOTs to reduce the excess fuel consumption and vehicle operating costs. So when you should be doing the preservation in order to improve uh, the roughness levels so that your, the fuel consumption and uh, vehicle operating costs for the users are going to be low. Uh, and we also developed a decision-making tool uh, from a pack trans research project for uh, federal highways. And in this one, you consider agency costs, which is the current method, but we also considered uh, the user cost, uh, and the, we did develop cost-benefit curves in which cost is the agency cost and the benefit is the benefit created for the user in terms of vehicle operating costs. Uh, and we developed this software uh, about six months ago, and we published the report. If you're interested, I can send you the report. By considering the user costs, uh, fuel consumption can be significantly reduced, and the greenhouse gas emissions can also be reduced uh, because the use phase is the most important phase for fuel consumption. So this is the payment life cycle, so I think you're all familiar with it. You design the payment, you produce the materials according to the design, con you con do the construction, there's the operations phase, which is the use phase, and then you do preservation and rehabilitation and reconstruction and recycling, and then you go back when your uh, design is completely failed, maybe in 80 or 100 years. And we, in the TAC, uh, with the TAC code project, we are trying to address the construction and preservation and rehab stages. Recycled payments will be addressing the preservation and rehab and the reconstruction and recycling stages. And we are also trying to address with MIT, MSU, and UC Davis uh, the payment deflection and fuel economy part. How can we improve the payments so that the vehicle operating costs can, go, uh, can be lower? And we also developed uh, and still working on the improvement of this decision-making tool uh, in which we are considering the design, recycling, preservation and operation stages, and we are planning to incorporate the material production and construction into the software uh, to be able to make more sustainable designs in the long run. 
So these are some publications we had, uh, like these are international journal papers we published within the last four years. And then we published uh, reports for uh, ODOT and uh, other agencies. If you're interested, you can send me an email. So this is my email address. I can send you the reports and papers and give, provide more information. And you can also get more information about our research group if you follow this thing. John Hickey, uh, Oregon Asphalt Pavement Association. Erda Mike, um, like what you are doing with obviously the uh, durability research, could you comment on the cost? So I, I think you were focusing on the semicircular bending beam test in conjunction with Hamburg testing for rutting. Yeah. What would the implementation plan look like? So say, you know, somebody, ODOT or somebody else wants to go and do some durability testing in addition to volumetrics. How would that be implemented and what would the cost of the test be? Direct tension cyclic fatigue is the best experiment. So it can actually uh, characterize the material better. But we didn't select it because SCB test was good enough and it's very simple to conduct. So the preparation is very easy. And you can just pay $5,000 to get the test equipment uh, to conduct the SCB test. So that's why it's very easy to conduct. Training is going to be very less. Uh, for the writing for Hamburg is a much simpler experiment. We use flow number and we are going to be using Hamburg as well. Uh, so the costs are going to be uh, much lower for these experiments too. So we try to uh, focus on, we just consider the practicality, uh, cost effectiveness when we uh, choose the experiments for the balanced mix design. So ODOT would do some of the testing and yeah. the contractor would incorporate it into its quality control program? I mean, this is the plan, but we haven't finalized the plan. This is an ongoing uh, research project. Uh, but contractor can do the design uh, or ODOT can do the design. This is going to be in addition to volumetrics because I'm not saying that volumetrics are not important. They are very important for construction. Uh, but having uh, the same volumetrics for two mixes is not, doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to perform the same. So this is going to be an additional uh, quality control test. I should know this and I, I don't. And with respect to the research on TAC, are you focusing in on some newer, better TAC products? I mean, how have the results gone, right? So what should we be looking at specifying? We are looking at application rates. Uh, so we are looking at uh, different tech goals like CSS1H, CSS1, uh, and engineered emulsions. I can easily tell you that engineered emulsions, like the new emulsions developed in Oregon, um, and we have another company from Idaho. So those are much better than uh, the CSS1H according to our lab test results. So their performance, their strength is very high. Uh, and at the same time, they are tracking less, which is a major advantage. So you are not having tracking issues in the field, which is directly affecting the uniformity of the tech codes. Uh, so that's why we are getting very positive results from those new emulsions. Yeah. Uh, Jim Weston, WSTOT. And relate, in regards to the tech codes, again, the, uh, you had the, uh, what, what I, the OFTCT, which is kind of like a, uh, a that one test method. Is there a specified is it reading like the amount of time and bond that it's getting prior to um, the pull-off on that? Or how does that operate, I guess, because um, we did some work in the old days with Texas on the Texas pull-off test. And it looks similar, but I just don't know yeah. how it compares. Constant uh, displacement rate on it. So we just lower it down, we control the temperature, we break the tack code first, and then it sticks to the tack code. And then we pull it up at this constant displacement rate. Uh, and this affects the performance. It's correlated with binder tests. The only problem is this, since this is a tension experiment, you cannot capture the texture effect. Uh, so this is, but you can evaluate different tech codes by conducting this experiment. Like this tech code is better than the other one. But the other one was much better for uh, field uh, shear strength measurement, the torque test, because you can capture the texture effect and the uh, emulsion performance at the same time. Thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.